A compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. If portraits could speak, The general did not like poets. He did not consider this occupation serious. As for this person, he was swarthy, fidgety, and quite short. His little fingernail was long like a Freemason's. However, when the portrait painter offered him some tea, they started talking. Aren't you a friend of Mr. Krylov, the writer? Do you mean the one from Uralsk, the man whose father fought against Pugachev? Of course, the general felt glad. None of the participants said if it really had been like this or completely different. They would never reveal the secrets hidden behind portraits any longer. He had to depict the moment of history and the personality of that epoch. His look is enigmatic. This picture is called a portrait with vivid eyes. By that time, he had been a famous portrait painter and had many orders. He was a very modest person. Chapter one, three people's secret. An artist placed a large crowd of our popular forces heads there. They are covered with glory of the successful campaign and eternal memory of 1812. Artist Vasily Trapinin did not like working without a live model in front of him. It took him more than a year to finish the pictures conventionally called Napoleonic War Heroes. It is considered that the portrait of Major General Borodin, the Ataman of the Ural troops, belongs in this category. The Ataman himself lived on the first floor of this house. The house built by Del Modino, a person from Italy, in Uralsk, was known as Borodin's because its first owner had been David Borodin. There are a lot of stories about that person. A French envoy arrived and demanded that they surrender immediately. Borodin dragged out the negotiations and ordered in the Kazakh language to start a breakthrough as soon as he gave a sign. Probably, he shouted, Alga! The French did not expect this turn of events and were having a rest after the battle. As a result, the Ural troops managed to get away thanks to the unexpected onslaught. It's impossible to say if it's just a legend or if it really was true. Anyway, at least two parts of the story are so. David really fought against the French and spoke Kazakh fluently. The second fact is not surprising. It was pretty normal for the high society living in the steppe regions to speak Kazakh. Their guests who arrived there even said that Kazakh was like French for them. A good knowledge of local folklore was a peculiarity of both Ural and Siberian Cossacks. Thus, it was normal for them to speak the Kazakh language and they even wrote songs in Kazakh. A sketch made by Vasily Troponin is in this hall. This is another museum. The picture is different too. Nevertheless, they are obviously connected. Probably it is the most famous and well-known picture of poet Alexander Pushkin. It is in St. Petersburg. In summer 1826, a participant of Suvorov's campaigns and the hero of the Napoleonic Wars, David Borodin, went from Urals to Moscow in order to attend the coronation of Emperor Nicholas I. It's known that Pushkin returned from exile in September 1826 and was in St. Petersburg in May 1827. It means he could have posed for the picture by Vasily Trepanin only during this short period. It was a coincidence that both Borodin and Pushkin ordered their portraits from the same artist in Moscow. Trepanin's life was hard too. 
He was an indentured artist of Count Morkov and was given freedom only in his adulthood. Freedom was bought for Tropinin thanks to public pressure when money was collected and freedom from serfdom was bought for him. After that, he could work as a free artist and free person. There's a short distance from Pushkin Museum in Moscow to the place where Troponin lived. There's a little outbuilding at the corner of Volkonka and Lenivka streets. It's considered that the portrait of Alexander was painted in this house. Most probably, Ataman Borodin came here to pose for his portrait too. As a rule, the artist worked on a few portraits simultaneously. He had to earn his living. Probably it was a commission portrait because Troponin's work were in high demand. If a person wanted to immortalize oneself for their family and descendants and can afford this work, why should he decline such an offer? As for the payment, Pushkin's friend Sobolevsky said that it cost 350 rubles. In comparison, the poet was paid 1,500 rubles for the Gypsies' poem. It remains unknown how much the portrait cost the Ataman. Chapter 2, Under Ataman's Supervision. Who likes looking at angry and stern faces? Why should unpleasant things which cannot be changed be conveyed to the canvas? Why should I leave these people who love this person with a negative impression and evoke bitter memories? Let them see and remember him in a happy period of his life. Most probably, Trepinin was attracted towards the classical style because of his all his characters were balanced, focused and solid. Trepinin was told that he flattered his characters. The artist did not oppose such assumptions and only smiled. In general, he was good-natured and forgiving. Nevertheless, this look can't be called pleasant. No matter in what direction you're going, his eyes will follow you. I mean, it doesn't matter from what angle you look at him. He will always look at you from the same angle. It's known that there are no casual details in the pictures by Tropinin. Most probably, there was something behind the strange expression in the eyes. I gaze unblinkingly at it while moving away. It keeps looking at me. Even when I approach the wall, it still glances at me. It's looking at me too. Is it looking at you at the same time? However, there's no mystery in it. This effect is achieved with the help of a special artistic technique. The model must look directly at the artist when they're being painted. The artist uses perspective in a certain way. As a result, it seems that they're looking at you. Everything was under the Ottoman's supervision. According to an eyewitness, David was respected and he watched over everyone. People said that Ottoman Borodin was the only one in the troops. It was written so in the military encyclopedia of 1911, which contained a print based on Troponin's picture. Many women who came here admire this. They say that the man is really handsome and well built. He was very tall and behaved like a landowner and was resourceful. We can say that Borodin inherited the right to be an Ataman. Pugachev's rebellion began because of his father, who was quite an odious person. He was a rich man who seized expanses of steppe belonging to everyone. He owned serfs living on free Cossacks land, was an aggressor and robber. This person had an iron will, violent temperament, and at the same time was a sly diplomat. If there hadn't been Matamyan Boriden near the Yaik River, Pugachev might not have appeared either. Matamyan took the main criminal to the place of his execution. Pushkin could not help developing an interest in such a bright character. In addition, Pushkin and Borodin had some mutual acquaintances. 
The writer Ivan Krylov, the son of Yaik City's commandant, was one of them. Borodin knew Krylov because he grew up there. Later, Krylov could recommend David Borodin to Pushkin so that he could ask him about how everything had happened. Borodin was 15 years old at that time. Between sittings, the artist often treated his guest to tea. Probably they talked while having tea. Borodin could tell Pushkin about Pugachev's rebellion from eyewitnesses who were still alive. He had returned from Uralsk a short time before and could promise to assist the poet with his journey. It is interesting that Pushkin told Princess Volkonskaya about his intention to write a new novel in 1827. Pushkin told me, I want to write a composition about Pugachev. I will go to that area, cross the Ural, go further, and then come to you to ask for shelter. Probably the idea of writing a novel about Pugachev came to Pushkin thanks to Borodin, and afterwards he heard the stories from Krylov and others. Incidentally, Pushkin and Borodin could meet during numerous balls, which were timed to coincide with the coronation. However, if the Ataman and poet were really acquainted with each other, it was doubtful that they could meet often. They were people of different mentality, different circles and generations. Borodin was over 60, while Pushkin was younger than 30. Chapter 3. Strange Stories A face is the most important detail of a portrait, and all the other things are secondary. When an, any person is sitting down to pose for a portrait, they should not be worried about the pose or position of their hands. Try to amuse them with conversation and even make them forget that they're posing for a portrait. They weren't destined to meet in Uralsk. The poet went on a literary business trip to the places famous for Pugachev's activities only in 1833. Ataman had died by that time. He passed away during an epidemic of cholera. However, when Alexander arrived in Uralsk, he stayed at David Borodin's house. There are 12 rooms upstairs. There was a bedroom, sofa room, and pantry. When guests arrived, they lived on the second floor. This house was for honored guests. Probably Pushkin spent many minutes looking at this portrait, recalling his acquaintance with the Ataman and thinking about his fleeting life. However, this is just a part of fiction, like the stories that this portrait took the Ataman's life. It happened because indigenous old believer David Borodin shaved his fatherland, as Ural Cossacks called their beards. The majority of Ural Cossacks were old believers. Some strange events occurred to the pictures by Tropinin, and the portrait of the Ataman was no exception. In 1960, local historian Nikolai Chesnokov found a mention of an unknown work by a famous artist, which had been in Uralsk for a long time. Afterwards, it was lost during the Civil War. Then they discovered that the portrait had been in a depository all the time. It was discovered by a mere chance in the Uralsk Museum. It was found in a terrible state somewhere in the depository, and a part of the picture had been torn. Later, the picture was restored and they checked its authenticity. Here you can see Trupinin's sign. The year is marked too. Some interesting events happened to the famous portrait of Pushkin. It was stolen, and they substituted one of a few copies for it. It took 20 years to confirm the authenticity of the picture. In fact, the artist himself had to do it. Epilogue, Resurrection in Time. Vasily Tropinin was a prolific artist. The Kastayev State Museum in Kazakhstan contains his works too. We have three works by Tropinin, and they are on permanent display. They are a portrait of a man, which we call portrait of a man wearing three medals, a portrait of a woman, and one more portrait of a man. 
Well, there is another secret. For example, we don't know who is depicted in this picture. Sooner or later, the secret may be uncovered too, as it always happens with portraits by Trupinin.